Father, we thank you for this beautiful time, beautiful season that we are entering, Father. We just thank you for the handiwork that you have done and for everything that you have provided for us. Father, it is our responsibility to spread your word and tell, tell the people about salvation and about the opportunity to live eternally with you. Father, we just pray that we would see the urgency of carrying your message to our friends and family and neighbors and the foreign country. Father, we're so thankful for the love that you have shown to us and the giving of your son to provide a way for us to enter heaven with you. Father, our greatest need this evening is forgiveness of sin. Father, we often fall short of what you would have us to do. Father, help us to return to your word and to learn and to be able to teach others. Father, we pray for knowledge. Give us the knowledge that we need. And then, Father, we ask that you would give us the wisdom to apply that knowledge that we might spread your word throughout the world. Father, you have shown great love in providing your son, giving your son. Father, we just thank you so much. Father, we thank you for the church here at the Rio. We thank you for Kevin and his efforts that he put forth to bring us the message and to teach us. Father, we just pray that you would make his work fruitful and that we will all be very supportive. Father, we just have many that are sick and hurting here in our congregation. Father, we just pray that you would be with those that are taking care of them, be with the doctors and nurses. Father, it's a tough time with this COVID. We're not sure how to deal with it. But Father, if we still <coughs> come to you, that you will provide the answers and you will lead us through this. You've always been present in our lives and sometimes we have ignored, ignored you and haven't come to you with our problems. Father, we just pray that we would learn to carry our problems to you and, and to, to your throne and that you would take care of us. Father, you know that you would be present in our lives and Father, we just pray for your presence to for guidance in the things that we do. And be with us now as we continue this service. Father, we just pray you be with Kevin as he brings this message, that it will be one that will stir us to greater service. Be with us now for all these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Could be one would be stand and get the paper plastic and uh, he may be. Do <laughs> 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 
We'll get you that invitation song in just a little bit. 745. Good evening. Great to see everybody today. Thank you so much for being here. We've been blessed with just a beautiful autumn day. Uh, it's, I'm a warm weather guy. I'm not looking forward to the cold, but I enjoy the fall. I enjoy a good campfire and, and just relaxing by the fire. So looking forward to that. And uh, we, uh, we're, we're actually going to put a campfire ring out here on the side of the building. So hopefully before it gets too cold, we might just bring our camping chairs out here and have a little service around the campfire one night and roast a few marshmallows when it's over, something like that. Or a hot dog. <laughs> I, I am the friend of hot dogs. <laughs> Beef hot dogs. I'm not a fan of the chicken, pork, turkey, you know, buzzard, whatever else they put in those things, yeah. But anyway, so we're looking forward to that. Looking forward to homecoming next week. Want to remind you, if you haven't already done so, uh, take these cards and you can hand them out. I've been mailing them. I've mailed a slew of these out. And they get there just as... I put, I put a regular stamp on them, but they get there just like the regular mail. So you still have time to send some of these out. Um, there's the, the church address is on the back. Just put the stamp up there and their address right there, and it just goes. It's pretty slick. I like it. Yeah, so don't forget to do that. There's still some available out in the lobby. Um, you know, Satan does whatever he can to wreak havoc in your life and in our life combined as the church. Um, and it's, it's interesting how sometimes we play along with him. You ever played along with him? Sometimes, whether we're cognizant of it or not, sometimes we play into his hand and we just go along with whatever he's actually planning for us and we're just uh, partners to it whether we realize it or not. And one of the things that we're going to talk about in our lesson tonight as we continue our series in Discovering Hope During Perilous Times is how wonderful it is to have godly men and elders of a congregation. And how blessed we are here at Berea that we have some fine men of God that serve as our elders. And I want you to know, they are authentic men of God to the core. They would be the first ones to tell you they're not perfect, but they are a blessing. They bless me personally, spending time with them, their encouragement, their foresight, their vision, their suggestions, uh, their prayer life, their concern for souls, the concern for the sick, concern for those that have needs is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful as they help to oversee and shepherd this flock here at Berea. And I want you to know that I uh, got the baptism of fire when I first started in ministry. I went to a congregation as an intern that didn't have elders. And that was a disaster. You should have seen the mess we were in there. The infighting and the carrying on. Uh, in fact, uh, there was an attempt to defraud the church out of property by members of the church uh, that were going to split the church over a million dollar piece of land the church owned. And back then, that was a lot of money. It's a lot of money today, but... But anyway, and uh, they were going to split the church, and then after the church was split, they were going to take the church's property, divide it, sell it to a, a real estate firm, development company, and they were all going to get a quarter of a million dollars apiece. I think the devil was in the middle of all that. Yeah. But it was, it was thwarted. It was... Uh, discovered and it was abandoned but um, just it just goes to show you that sometimes uh, in the Lord's church um, bad things can happen and we don't always handle it well which I'm just leading up to tell you something that's very important about us these babies right here these pews right here they're comfortable well might want to stay a little longer tonight. 
because they're going out tomorrow. I know, I know. But no, we're not standing up. Our chairs are already here. They're, they're all out in the lobby over here and they're over there in the fellowship hall. Um, we had to order them when we could get them. And we had how many months in advance did we have to order them? And it took forever to get them here. So we have them. And um, we, we need to go ahead and get them used because we can't send them back even though our other project is delayed. And so the pews are coming up tomorrow. And I know I love pews. I've been with pews all my life. But I've also been in congregations where they have chairs set up like what we're going to have. And it'll be much more functional for a wide variety of reasons. And I think it'll end up blessing us to get more people here and to be able to do more things with more people. It'll be a blessing. Might not be our own personal um, uh, preference, uh, but uh, there's a lot of things more important than pews. We shouldn't let pews get anything going here. Can I just say it like that? Yeah. And so I was just saying that because if you've got things in your own pews that you're used to setting in, your pillows, your uh, Bibles, other things, take them with you tonight. You can bring them back later. But these folks are going to be here at 7 o'clock in the morning to start removing the pews. So just a heads up on that. And just look forward to that nice cushiony chair you're going to have. That it's linked together. There'll still be rows. It'll just be optional about how we fix the rows and how we do things. And then we'll have uh, the ability to do multi-things in this room that, rather than just the way the chairs are set up now as pews. So, said all that to say this. Um, it is what it is. Let's just go with it. It's just stuff that the Lord's going to burn up one day anyway. So let's just not let that get the best of us. Amen? Amen. So let's just go with it. Let's just go with it. Not with the pews. I'm just saying go with the, yeah. <laughs> you stay here. Let the pews go. Yeah. All right. So. <laughs> oh, they're going to get a final resting place, yes. Um, they're, just, they're just being removed by the company that we had hired to remove them and dispose of them for us. I haven't gone down that road that far with them. We've had the opportunity to try to get some folks to come get them. Uh, there's been a couple different congregations that came and looked at them and measured them. These are very long pews. They're 15 feet, 6 inches long. So they don't fit in a lot of places. Um, Antioch and Cindy Antioch and Legardo came and looked at them and could use them, but they're, they're too long. They won't fit in their building. Anyway, um, our new, beautiful, comfortable, versatile chairs will be here starting on Wednesday night. So you just come right on back because you're going to love them. All right? It'll be great. Just want to let you know that, though, so we go ahead and, and get your stuff out of here. I don't want anybody losing anything in the shuffle. Yes? Can you bring your own chair? <laughs> Lee, I thought you were my friend. Partners in the ministry. It, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's just let that question lie. I don't know what to, how to say that, but anyway. We have plenty of beautiful chairs. Plenty. So hopefully they'll be uh, functional for us and they'll be a blessing to us. And look at it this way. There's places I've done mission work that we actually sat on milk crates because there were no chairs. And the kids sat on the ground. So we're blessed. Amen? Amen. All right. 1 Peter chapter 5. Begin talking about advice to elders. Um, there are several terms in scriptures that are referenced as elders. And they're used interchangeably. Some refer to the office of elder or bishop. Some refer to function, such as shepherd or overseer. And so I want us to think about the, the role that elders play in our congregation and congregations uh, throughout the world and throughout time. 
ever since the church was established uh, and elders were ordained at each of the congregations. Uh, it's interesting because there are a lot of people that don't understand biblical terms for elders and the differences between elders and preachers. I want to unequivocally tell you today, I'm not your pastor. Pastor is not a preacher. Pastor is an elder. It's a shepherd. It's someone who is in the office of elder. So I'm not your pastor. Um, there are preachers that I know of that have served as evangelists and elders. Um, it takes a special person for that to work out real well. I've seen that thing not work out real well. Um, but nevertheless, um, we're going to talk for a few moments about them and then go on to some practical advice for Christianity to the church as a whole. When Jesus is given many different uh, analogies, since Jesus is the door, Jesus is the way, Jesus is truth, Jesus is the life, one of the things that Jesus himself identifies himself as, as the, the shepherd. And one of the things that the elders are referred to as are shepherds of the flock. Now, one of the problems that started out with the church when apostasy, apostasy began, or the falling away, was people were given titles and were given offices that were not found in Scripture. The first that happened was uh, there was a council of elders, and they would come from all different regions to one particular place, and they would have a meeting, and they would discuss problems in the church, and then they would talk about it, and then they would go back to their own congregations and um, discuss what was going on and make sure that they handle things in a biblical way. But what happened was, is that in time, they gave those elders who came to, to the, the council meetings, they gave them the titles of bishop. So they went back to their home congregations, they called them the bishop of the church, rather than just one of the elders. They were above the other elders in the congregation, and that began the ball rolling downhill in a non-biblical way. To the extent now that uh, that developed into uh, cardinals, bishops, and, and other titles that were given, when God always always intended for every congregation to be autonomous. What does autonomous mean? Independent, self-governing. So that the elders of the Berea Church of Christ, they have no authority and they have no say at what happens in any other congregation, be it in Lebanon, in Wilson County, in Middle Tennessee, or wherever. It is not our business to try to tell another congregation what to do. They have no authority over any other congregation. They are over this congregation. Okay? So we'll talk about their role as shepherds of this congregation. Peter says, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Now, Peter's wanting to give some authority to what he has to say. What are the different things about Peter that gives him authority so that elders of the Lord's church should listen to what he says and do it? He says, I also am an elder. What else? I am a witness of Christ's sufferings. It's not just the fact that he witnessed Christ. Uh, it's what? He's an apostle. And so that he was ordained by Christ himself to teach and to continue his work after Jesus ascended back to heaven. So he has the authority to teach what Jesus told him to teach, to make sure that the church, as it continues to grow, does things in accordance with the will of Jesus as the will of the Lord. Okay, So he wants you to know, I'm an elder. What I'm saying to you comes from experience. I'm a, I also am a witness of Christ's sufferings. I was a part of the ministry of Christ. I witnessed his death on the cross, the payment of our sins. And he said, and I also am going to share in the glory to be revealed. So that, and this is something that Lee is referring to back uh, in our study of 1 and 2 Corinthians. It is amazing to me how many people just snub their nose at the apostles. How that people gave 
Paul a hard way to go and just would not respect him and would not listen to him. And Peter is wanting to um, cut that off at the pass and say, what I'm telling you, I'm telling you as an elder myself, what I'm telling you is as an apostle, what I'm telling you is someone who walked with Jesus, saw him suffer, saw his ministry, and I know what I'm talking about as an inspired man of God as well. Okay? So then he goes on to say, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So when we think about the office of elder, someone who would serve a congregation as an elder, there are intermittent terms, the interchangeable terms that are used by Peter and are found in other places. Four terms used here in this passage are overseer, bishop, pastor, and shepherd. All are things referring to elders in the Lord's church. Not just of the office itself, but also of the duties, the responsibilities of one who is an elder. And he goes on to say in this passage that elders are to be shepherds of a congregation. Now, it's, the analogy doesn't suit us as good as it did people of the first century because uh, we probably don't have sheep. Maybe some of you do have a farm and you've had some sheep. But what, what comes to mind when you think about someone being a shepherd over the souls of others? What did a shepherd do? Watched over the flock, Watched over the flock Chris? Watched closely. Watch closely. Because those sheep can do what? Wander away. They can get in a mess just like that. Raise them from lambs. How about this? Have to protect. Exactly the next thing I was going to say. They're for the protection of the sheep to make sure that nothing happens to them, that, the, that uh, predators do not come in and hurt them. They're responsible for the feeding of the flock. Did sheep know where to go get their food? No, they were led by the shepherd. And that brings out another thing, that shepherds lead the sheep by example. The sheep just follow the shepherd. So some of the best leadership that you'll see in the Lord's church is by godly men who are doing the will of God and we just follow their example. Okay? Anybody else? Yeah. And as leaders of the flock, as shepherds of the flock, as bishops and overseers, as pastors of the flock, they have authority over us. I work under the oversight of our elders at Berea. I am not over them, they're over me. They uh, guide me and direct me, and they, I work under their auspices. I am not independent. I'm not someone telling them what to do. That's the biblical flow chart of authority in Scripture. Okay. Do we have a biblical admonition as the sheep to follow the leadership of our shepherds? The only time that we would ever not is if what? If they lead us astray. If they are wolves in sheep's clothing who try to lead us away from the will of God. If they're teaching us or telling us to do things that are contrary to what the Bible says, that would be the only time that we would ever um, rebel against them, if you want to use that term. Okay? Um, and it, over and over again in Scripture, we need to, to love them and encourage them and support them so that their work is not a drudgery but a joy. The way that we respond to them, the way that we pray for them, the way that we talk to them, encourage them, means everything. Someone who's um, a know-it-all or a jerk or very sarcastic or 
Got something smart to say all the time. Are they blessing elders? No, 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 not at all. He goes on to say, but elders are to serve willingly, uh, not of compulsion. That what they do, they do because they want to be an elder of the Lord's church. That it's a blessing to be a... Not that there's not any responsibility. There's a lot of responsibility. And I'm sure they feel it, the weight of their responsibility from time to time. But it's a joy to serve the Lord. It's, there are difficulties in preaching and teaching the Word of God. There are difficulties in being uh, uh, an elder of the Lord's church. But it is a blessing. It is a blessing. And we need to be a blessing to them. So we need them to do so willingly. Uh, that's the way God wants it to be. And then he goes on to say, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. So the responsibility of elders, first of all, is to watch over the flock. And their flock is their particular congregation. You recall that when Paul went on the first missionary journey and people obeyed the gospel, what was the purpose of the second missionary journey? They went back and visited all the churches and appointed elders to serve in these congregations. It has always been God's plan for there to be biblical leadership in every congregation, elders and deacons. That's the plan. That's the idea. Um, second of all, they're willing to serve willing, not being pressured to do so. Not greedy. I put this in parentheses. You can be greedy for a lot of things. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, when we talk about our relationships with each other, he goes on to talk about relationships from the younger toward the older. By the term elder itself, there's the reference or inference that an elder is not to be a novice, and it's to be someone who is older. Sometimes... Um, there is a rub or there is a clash between us when we are younger toward those who are older. Did you ever experience that with your parents? Really? Just going to be quiet on that one, are you? 
I remember when I remember I was 18 years old. I, I actually graduated uh, in December. I didn't get my diploma until June, but I finished all of my schoolwork and finished school in December, and I worked from January all the way till August, full-time work, to earn money to go to college. And so I always had a curfew in high school. So when I graduated, I said, Dad, I think maybe we could do away with the curfew. I mean, when I go away to college, you know, I'll have a curfew that I've been in the dorm, but you know, I, I just think that maybe I'm, I'm ready to be without a curfew. He said, you know, I think you are. I trust you. No curfew. I said, all right then. So I asked this sweet little deacon's daughter out on a Friday night. We went to the ball game. We were going to her mom and daddy's house afterward, and we were going to watch a movie. Phone rang at 12.30 in the morning. What are you doing? We're watching a movie at Kim's house. Her mom was right here with us. It's 12.30. I know, but I don't have a curfew. He goes... Let's see, they're about, uh, they're about eight miles away. There's traffic lights. I don't want you to speed. I'm going to give you 20 minutes. you got 20 minutes to get here. Do you understand? I said, but Dad, he goes, 19. <laughs> and I thought that was so unfair. I thought you told me I couldn't have a curfew. I'm with this family. The dad was watching the movie with us. He fell asleep. But mama's right there with us. We're in their den. We're not doing anything wrong. We went to a ball game. We went and got some pizza. Came over to their house. We're watching a movie. I'm going to come home right after the movie. But he goes, I gave you some freedom and you abused it. You don't stay at somebody's house to 1230. You, how long would you have stayed? I said, till the movie was over. How long was that? I said, I don't know. See there, you got no sense. <laughs> Yeah, so I had a curfew till I went off to college after that. But anyway, but I'm just saying, um, sometimes we don't understand why things are the way they are when we're young. We think we know everything. We think we got all the answers. Um, to be honest with you, our 15-year-olds think we're dumb as a brick. You're just like, psh, they know everything until they don't know everything. But you can relate to that, can't you? Same thing in the Lord's church. Sometimes people think that they know the best way and that they are going to buck the system and they're going to say their piece and I don't believe in it, I don't like it, I don't agree with it. And, I'm gonna, and it's okay to, in a godly, respectful way to sit down with an elder or the elders and say, I just want to talk with you about so-and-so. There's nothing wrong with that. We have godly men here who will sit down and talk to anybody in here about anything. They would love to hear from you if there's something that's upsetting you. They're not lording it over us. But at the same time, we have to submit to them and humble ourselves. That's the advice that Peter gives. Be submissive. The word there means to yield. I'll just tell you something, that's not an American term. You ever come up on a yield sign and realize these people are not yielding? You know, you get on the interstate, there's a yield sign, but they just go flying right in there. My dad got into a car wreck because he was in this line of traffic. There was nowhere to go. This lady just come flying down the on-ramp and just hit them right in the side of the car. She didn't yield. What does it mean to yield to the elders, to be submissive to them? It's to say, I believe in your authority as an elder. I respect who you are as a shepherd of the flock. And I'm going to submit, I'm going to yield to what you all think is best. And as I said before, unless things are not biblical, unless things are taking people away from the ideas of God's Word, then we should be under the authority and yield to our elders. He says, God will lift up the humble. There's a song that we sing, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. 
and he will lift you up. It comes from Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 34. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the God's almighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. If there was ever a time of high anxiety, we're living in it. We're living in it. Um, these are anxious times. These are fretful times for many people. Um, and as much as we don't want to worry, as much as we don't want to fret, as much as we don't want to have anxiety, it can get us sometimes. What, is, what does Peter say you need to do with that anxiety? Give it to God. Cast your anxiety on Him, on the Lord, because He cares for you. He is greater than anything you're going through. So we're all going to suffer. We're all going to be stressed. We're all going to have difficult times. Will God give you the ability to get through it? Yes. Will God help give you wisdom to get through it? Yes. Paul said, it is when those moments that I am made weak that I actually then become strong. So sometimes we go through some things to help us spiritually grow. But cast your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Now I'm going to tell you, being someone that has worked in the public not long ago and worked with uh, younger people, young adults, very young adults, it is amazing to me how many of them have anxiety. I didn't have anxiety when I was a young person. Did you have anxiety when you were 20, 25? You did. Some people did, but I didn't. I thought life was going along pretty good here. Now, there were times when you'd have anxiety over something that happened, some stress or an event that happened. But listen, folks, there are some of these young people who... Most all of them don't know the Lord in the workplace that I was with. They are having a struggle dealing with life. Now, I want to say this. Sometimes people are predisposed, even chemically in their bodies, physiologically speaking, people are predisposed to depression, to anxiety. That's a whole different matter than when we allow life itself to overwhelm us. I don't want anybody to ever think that if you have enough faith, you don't need to have to worry about depression or have anxiety. Godly men and women suffer from depression and have anxiety sometimes. And they need some medicine. My father suffers from severe depression. His body doesn't make enough serotonin. And so he can get in a deep, dark depression. He's actually had to have shock treatments before. It's so bad. Um, and so I don't want people to think that their faith isn't strong or that they're not all that they should be for God because they do have things like that. It's just some people are predisposed to having those things. Just like some of us are predisposed to have other physical ailments and problems. There's no shame in it. There's no difficulty in that. But even at the same time, even if you're someone that deals with depression and anxiety or whatever your sickness or illness is, should we fall into the arms of the Lord and, and count on Him to sustain us and to hold us up during our worst days? Absolutely. Well, understand this, that people who don't have a spiritual dimension to their life, how do they cope with the greatest questions of life and the greatest problems in life? How do they cope with, how did I get here? Why am I here? And what's going to happen to me when I die? 
when you don't have the answers to those basic human questions, do you think that causes stress and anxiety? You better believe it. You know, Ricky, um, all that you've been through with your sicknesses, you've been sick man for, I guess, probably at least six months or, or so since March. High blood pressure, blood sugar off the charts. COVID comes to your family. You lose your son. Let me ask you a question. If it hadn't been for the Lord, could you imagine... It was hard. It's hard for Christians to go through all that. But if it hadn't been for the Lord, He sustained you through all that. He, you're here because of Him. I believe that. And He's sustaining you in your grief, in your loss. And if it hadn't been for the Lord, can you agree? Can you concur in your life? If it hadn't been for the Lord, where would we be? Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To Him be power forever and ever Amen. So I want to talk to this practical advice as we close our lesson tonight. This is the gist of what Peter just said. Cast your anxiety, cast your cares, cast your, your worries, cast those things upon the Lord. He will sustain. Number two, rest in God's protection and care. Sometimes we rob ourselves of joy because we're not relying on Him. We borrow a lot of problems from tomorrow or next week or next month when we should be living for the day. Take no thought for your life what you will eat or what you will drink or for your clothing, what you will wear, for all those things. He talked to us about the consider the lilies of the field, the birds of the air, and yet your heavenly Father knoweth all of their needs. How much more are you valuable than they, O ye of little faith? Thirdly, control yourself and be alert. Be aware of Satan's presence and work in the world today. And as I mentioned earlier, not only be aware of it, but realize this, he's after you. Do you sense things that have happened in your life where you know the devil's got, he's after me? Well, that's the devil trying to get me. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever said something or done something and you realize that's not of the Lord? Do you believe that if Satan is going to try to tempt Christ, he's going to try to tempt you? He's, as Peter says, a roaring lion seeking who may devour. You know what you need to do tonight? You need to go get that National Geographic. Go turn to some of the wild channels or whatever and just watch the lions eat. They actually lurk around in the bushes. Their prey's grazing. They have no idea. And at the last second, they pounce. They come flying out of there. And they, those other animals have no idea. And the lions are so powerful and so fast that even when they do realize what's happening, it's too late. Do you think that there are times that people didn't even realize what was going on until they're in over their head? And that's the devil. He works on us. Resist the devil. You resist the devil, he will flee from you. He is not to be taken lightly. Stand firm and realize that others are going through struggles too. It's not just you. And that God has made preparations for all of us who will remain faithful to Him all the days of our life. Trust in the Lord. 
He has a source of unlimited grace. He called you to glory. He will restore you and strengthen you. And remember that God's power is unmatched. It's limitless and eternal. God is fully equipped to handle our affairs in life. Trust in Him. And if worse comes to worse and you leave this old world, you just graduate to glory. The best is ahead. So, I, uh, I'm going to conclude First Peter tonight. We have homecoming next week. We are having our regular service. Then during our Bible study period, we're going to have an old gospel singing. Uh, you can we'll have the opportunity to uh, request songs if you like, but we're going to have a singing. And then we're going to have lunch together. And then next Sunday, uh, next, uh, after lunch, we'll have our, our actual our evening service right after lunch. And then you'll be dismissed for the day. And then the following week, um, we have the fall festival on Saturday. We'll get back into our regular mode on that Sunday night, and we'll start setting Second Peter, Lord willing, on uh, that next Sunday night, which would be two weeks from tonight. Anybody have any thoughts, questions, comments? I said it to start out with, and I deeply mean this. I would say it if none of them were sitting here. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are so blessed by our elders. Encourage them. Say a good word for them. Send them a card. Pray for them. Encourage them because God has His hands on this. God has His hand on this congregation. He's at work here and He's blessing here. And they are a big part of that blessing. If you need to come for prayer or any other need spiritually, come now as together we stand and sing.
Father in heaven, we come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, knowing he was there when he came. We are so thankful for this another day we have to come to worship you. We always pray that our worship is in accordance with your will. If not, please help us to get that straightened out. Be with us now, we're about to separate from this place. Go with us for homes, go to work. Try to help us be allies to someone else. Come back for all.